So, um, so I'm talking only about PTSD for a change. I mean, some of the uh, talks, or most of the talks today, I think, refer to, uh, to TBI. And my expertise is really PTSD. And PTSD is really about fear uh, and fear um, symptoms or fear-related symptoms. And, the, uh, and when um, we are kind of attempting to, to be more specific and to um, kind of aim at more personal, personalized medicine, my emphasis is really about um, why the brain of a PTSD patient is uh, showing uh, deficits in fear processing and fear expression. Most of the PTSD symptoms are really about unrelenting fear about others, fearing for my safety, always feeling like I have to be on guard. And um, when, when this is translated to the lab, um, we are trying to really model um, some mechanisms that will tap onto this fear symptoms, uh, system. And specifically, we are interested in fear extinction, or extinction of traumatic memories. Um, so I would like to um, kind of show you um, how we address uh, fear extinction in the brain. Um, basically, uh, looking at the brain, we are very interested in a number of brain areas that um, I think also Bob, you uh, kind of um, mentioned, uh, you know, one of them in your talk. We are interested very much in the relationship between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, yep. with the idea that um, yep. amygdala is very much the hub in which uh, fear is um, kind of coded and, and expressed, and the prefrontal cortex, cortex um, is attempting to modulate and, uh, and, and kind of control uh, the amygdala. We are very much interested also in the hippocampus and the uh, anterior cingulate cortex. That's the, the cingulate cortex, especially the anterior side of the cortex, is very much involved in the modulation of the emotional responses. And much of our studies are really um, targeting the ACC, and I'll show you some examples about that. So um, when, you, when you speak about extinction, there are two stages for extinction. One is about uh, whether the patient is enabled to, um, to normalize um, the capacity to extinguish, extinguish fear learning. But, and not only that, whether this extinction process can be uh, retained, um, uh, uh, not only on the short term, but also on the long term. In other words, whether the, the patient with PTSD is, uh, will be able to, to uh, be less sensitive to fearful memories uh, over time. Um, and I think what, I mean, Ben, uh, from your experience, uh, you probably can attest to the fact that you can achieve some sense of safety, but over the long term, you know, when, especially when you confront with stressors, you know, to feel safe and secure, it's really a main problem among uh, PTSD patients. And the brain areas that are involved uh, in uh, extinction recall uh, or extinction retention uh, are the medial prefrontal cortex, which as compared to people without PTSD, is usually under-engaged and under-activated, and hippocampus is under-activated, and the dorsal ACC, which is positively correlated with amygdala, is usually uh, over-activated. So in our studies, we are using MRI, uh, about two, three minutes, yeah. We're using MRI, kind of multi-modal MRI, doing both a, a structural MRI, functional MRI, and also looking at functional connectivity uh, in order to, um, to identify correlates of, of extinction and extinction recalls and whether we are able to normalize them over the course of a treatment. The, uh, the talk today will involve 
the treatment of prolonged exposure, which uh, I kind of sense that you guys are not great fans of prolonged exposure, no. and for good reasons, really. <laughs> but nevertheless, about 50% of the patients, uh, s uh, especially civilian PTSD, a little bit less uh, in the veteran population, about 50% respond pretty well to prolonged exposure. Prolonged exposure is psychotherapy, and not involving TMS or, uh, or medication. And when you do, you ask the patient really to recall the trauma again and again until the patient don't feel really the, uh, the fear that, uh, that kind of augmented the experience of, uh, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the experience of trauma. And we, um, this is a brief therapy. Uh, by the way, it's not a therapy that, that your organization uh, help us to, uh, to do. For that, we don't have data yet. So I'm gonna talk about prolonged exposure only today. But nevertheless, this is a brief therapy, about 10 to 12 session, and we, um, and we image the brain before and after the treatment. And um, first of all, we ask ourselves whether the size of the hippocampus is really predictive of success in treatment. And we found, uh, interestingly, that, um, that people with large hippocampus are doing better in treatment as compared to people with smaller hippocampus. That, by the way, is one idea about what to do with patients with different biological markers. So perhaps people with smaller hippocampus may be more benefited with um, TMS or oxygen treatment or, uh, or what you do uh, in your treatment, treatment with patients with larger hippocampus maybe do better with psychotherapy, talk therapy. And, um, and, and this we want to measure them all mm -hmm. with you. You know, that's one of the things we want to do is work with Bob and Lorraine and you. And this is and one example where size really matters. <laughs> <laughs> in, the brain, in the brain, in the brain. <laughs> looking, looking at functional MRI, um, and that's something I think that, Bob, you will be interested to see. Um, we are able to see some improvement uh, in the RECC in the form of getting the, getting the rostral side of the cingulate to be less activated. Mm -hmm. um, following the course of a treatment as compared to a pre-treatment uh, assessment. And we are also, and this is also a paper, that's, that's a paper in press now. Uh, we have shown that, um, that psychotherapy, 10 session of prolonged exposure, uh, was resulted in reduced volume of the RCC and thinning of the RCC. That's kind of interesting because when you have a brain region that is kind of excessively activated, um, uh, probably because it, you know, as a singular trying to kind of modulate, you know, amygdala activation. If you if you let this area of the brain to be uh, uh, to be less activated, it's showing to be uh, nicely correlated with uh, reduction of symptoms after therapy. Um, uh, and that this is kind of, you know, another kind of structural biomarker for treatment success. And finally, uh, when we are looking at coupling between various areas of the brain um, through um, a method um, that named resting, uh, uh, resting state uh, functional connectivity, we, we can see a, a very nice improvement in the coupling between the uh, BLA, the amygdala, and the, pref and, and the, and the OFC, uh, the orbital uh, prefrontal cortex, as well as between the hippocampus and the, um, and the orbital frontal uh, cortex. And taking together, uh, I think what you know, this piece of data uh, is showing is that um, Plasticity really is the name of the game. Uh, we can, uh, PTSD patients are, um, are affected by the environment, by stresses and trauma of the uh, environment, and the brain is reacting to that. Structurally, 
and functionally. If you provide them with uh, effective treatment, we can reverse at least um, uh, among some of them, 50, 60 percent of them we can reverse uh, structural damage, we can reverse functional damage, we can increase um, uh, uh, extinction recall of traumatic memory is also good news. Um, so this is it for me. I try to rush over my slides. You really and, rushed over them. Thank and, you. And I would like to finish by saying something that Shalom Ash, you know, a famous uh, Jewish uh, poet came to America after, after the Holocaust. And he was saying that it's really not about the power to remember, but maybe it's very opposite, the power to forget, which is necessary condition for our ex existence. Okay, thank you guys. I think